Stephen, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, Joe. It's good to be here. Such a pleasure. So in the book, Turning Pro, you make the case that your life was essentially segregated into sections, into two sections, before Turning Pro and after. So how would you best describe your amateur days? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, when I was uh, 23 years old or 22 years old, I quit a job in advertising in New York City to write a novel. And it completely fell apart. I completely fell apart. I got to 99.9% .9 of the way through and then choked, you know? And uh, so that was like the total start of my amateur period. I mean, I was obviously an amateur because I couldn't finish the job. And what, what happened was um, uh, my marriage broke up. I lost my jobs. I, uh, I wound up kind of on the road living in a van, living in a Chevy van. I drove, and I drove back and forth across the United States 13 different times just basically running away from one thing or another, you know, getting a job, quitting the job, et cetera, et cetera. So that was definitely my amateur days in the sense that I wasn't accomplishing anything. I had no clue what my life was about. I was just in the, you know, like a rat running through a maze and banging its head on various walls. Um, so that was definitely amateur stage one uh, of my life. And how many jobs? I think, oh, yeah. I think a lot of people live, you know, one way or another, live that that way. You know, they're sort of searching for who they really are, what their calling is, what they're what they were put on, and they're trying, you know, various different alternatives. And things uh, sort of work, or they don't work completely, or they almost work. And and that's that sort of stage. I think that's pretty natural for most of us. I think. Definitely. So for context, like during this period, I mean, how many jobs did you work? I mean, because from what I understand, I mean, you flew through them. <laughs> how many jobs did you go through at this stage? I, I've never counted it up, but, you know, it was maybe 20 or something like that. You know, I drove trucks. I worked on offshore oil rigs. I picked fruit. Uh, I was a school teacher. I worked in a mental hospital. I worked in advertising, et cetera. So I just did a lot of different things. In um, Turning Pro, I think you make the point that you got to 31 and you said that you had a book in mind and that if you didn't finish the book, you were planning to kill yourself, which I, I, I was just blown away by. I mean, because if you did, we wouldn't have the wonderful books behind me. So what was going through your mind at this stage? What was this specific point of your life like? Uh, well, I had, I had tried to write a book, as I said, when I was real, when I was 22, 23, and uh, and that exploded, and my whole life exploded, and I felt I kind of lived the next um, six or seven years were sort of dominated by a sense of shame. I really felt like I had let down my wife, I had let down my family. I was estranged from my family. Um, I just felt like uh, you know an utter failure that I just couldn't get it together. And so when I, at, when I, uh, the second book that I tried to write, I saved up, you know, what to me was a lot of money, $2,700. Believe it or not, I could live for a year on that. And I, and I moved to this little house that I could afford in California. And I just thought, I'm going to fit, I've got next, another book I want to try to write. And I'm going to finish it this time or die trying, you know? I mean, I probably wouldn't have really killed myself, but it was one It was one of those things where, you know, you just, there's no plan B, you know, you just got, if I failed again doing that, I don't know what I would have done with myself. So, um, so that was, uh, that was the point of that. I love it, man. So obviously you are, I mean, if you don't mind me saying, one of the great nonfiction writers of our time in my humble opinion I know of many people's as well so how long were you writing for before your career went off I just want to build some context here uh well I say I think I, you know I keep forgetting I think I wrote for like 18 years or something like that before I got my first dollar 
which was uh, an option on a screenplay that I wrote, $3,500 option on a screenplay that never got made. And I think it was another 10 years. Then I actually had a career as a screenwriter and I began making money. You know, uh, not very much money, <laughs> but uh, at least I was doing something. But it was another 10 years before my first novel was published. So all, to, all in like about 28 years, something like that. Crazy. And that first book, which you were talking about when you were 23, you mentioned that um, you got most of the way through and it didn't come out. I'm trying to remember whether it was in Turn in Pro or the War of Art. But I think it was Turn in Pro where you talk about um, in World War I, soldiers would shoot themselves in the foot to get out of going across, going out to battle. So what happened to this point? Why did that book never get finished? What was the reason behind that? Um, I always, well, we're going to talk no, more, I know, Joe, about resistance with a capital R, which it, to me is this... Uh, negative force that afflicts anybody that's trying to be an artist or an entrepreneur or anybody that's trying to move from a lower level to a higher level. Um, it's a negative force that just tries to sabotage you. Self-sabotage, self-doubt, fear, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that I, I say in the War of Art is that resistance is always strongest at the finish line. A lot of us can get almost all the way through something, but at that moment, sort of like a tidal wave of, of self-sabotage comes up. And that, or at least that's how it affected me. But I could write day to day. I could work for a year. I could work for two years. But what I couldn't do is I couldn't finish. You know, I couldn't get to the point where you're really um, putting yourself out there. You really commit. Like I see you have Seth, one of Seth Godin's book behind you in the cabinet. And what he, he, the word he uses for this is shipping. You know, he's thinking kind of in terms of like, if you've just designed, if you're Steve Jobs and you've designed a new iPhone, there comes a day when you have to ship, right? It's, it, you have to say, it's done. I'm now going to show it out to the world. And that's a really scary day because it can completely fail or fizzle or whatever. So what happened with me was I just got to that point where I was at the very end and I just, you know, self just blew my everything up, you know. I love it, man. I, I, when I was when I read the War of Art, um, it was sort of around the time where we were pretty much amateurish with with this show, uh, um, and it made me think about the resistance that I've been facing. And the best way I could describe resistance is, I'm swimming in it every single day. Right. Still today, I mean, you mean? Still to this day. Uh -huh. I'm in a, a constant battle with myself. And it's interesting because when I really look at it, the biggest resistance that I face is unfortunately at the hands of other people. So questions like, will our listeners like what I'm putting out? Will they resonate with what I'm saying? Will the guests think that I'm prepared enough? Will other people like my Instagram post? Uh -huh. It's like a constant battle of, um, will they uh, of what will they think, which is always going through my mind? Will it be good enough? Um, so I wonder, is this something you relate to this sort of validation of others? Uh, to some extent, yes, but let me ask you something, Joe. Sure. How, how do you deal with that? What great question? So, well, it's, it's interesting because the there was one author, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, it was, it was actually a religious text, I'm not a religious person, but it was a, a theologian by the name of uh, Forrest Church. And ah, um, he... Great name, yeah. <laughs> great name, yeah. And uh, in one of his books, he wrote about um, that he basically came up with three rules for life. And that was, want what you have, do what you can, and be who you are. So I sort of tell myself before I release every podcast, do what I can. So I've just sort of tried to like snooker ball myself mentally with that. <laughs> ah, well, that's interesting. But I, I would sort of say the same thing. Um, you know, uh, I think I was lucky in a way that it took me so long to get success. And that I failed so many times because it's sort of, that like your fears, Joe, 
are people going to want what I what I'm putting out there? They were completely realized to me over and over and over again. You know, the answer was no. They don't want what I'm doing. No, it's not good enough. No, it's not interesting. You know, and so that sort of forced me to say to answer the question: Why am I doing this? You know, is it is it because I want money or I want success or I want validation? And I had to answer because I wasn't getting any of that. So. I had to say to myself, the, the, why I'm doing, I'm doing this just for the work itself, just for the fun of writing another story or taking another shot at something. So I, I'm really not too worried. I mean, everybody's worried about what people are going to say, you know, is, a, is the next book or the next piece or whatever going to be a bomb or is it going to work? But I've also, I mean, I've, I, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, the book, I have a book that's coming out in March and it's, it's my 20th book. And so many of them have just either not necessarily failed, but they just sort of get out there and nobody even knows they're there. And they just sort of lie there, you know? So, and the ones that I had the highest hopes for are the ones that usually just laid there, you know? So to some extent, I've got a thick skin for that, but you never get really thick skin. It always hurts. But like that, those three rules for life, you know, you just gotta be who you are, do what you can and get it out there. It's hard, it's really hard. I love that, man. Here's a question I would love to ask you because we recently had Seth on the show. I know you're a great friend of Seth and I, I would love to ask you this because I, I wish I'd asked him this. So like, um, you know, like Seth, you've obviously written some wonderful pieces of work. I'd love to know when you release a great book, like let's say the uh, the War of Art or Turning Pro, or in Seth's case, Lynchpin or The Purple Cow, do you feel more pressure after releasing a great book to publish the next one? Uh, no, and here's the reason why. Like with The War of Art, that is now approaching, I think, a million copies sold. But when it first came out, it bombed. Nobody, nobody knew about it. It took, it came out in 2002. So it's 18 years old. And it's sort of, um, in other words, what I'm trying to say, Joe, is I've never had a book come out where all of a sudden it was a hit, you know, never, you know? It sort of, it takes a long time to kind of get going. And it's like starting, you know, a hundred car railroad train, you know, it takes forever to get that sucker going. So, so no, I, I haven't felt any pressure because by the time, if a book was a hit, it became a hit like 12 years after it was out and I'd already done another 10 books, you know, so, so no, I haven't. Now, Seth, maybe it did, it's, it's too bad you didn't ask him because he has had a bunch of books that came out and were just instant, you know, sensations. But, uh, you know, I've never had that in, in anything. That's fair enough. So I figured this would be a great point as we're sort of on this um, on this conversation of the amateur and the professional. So what would you best describe the difference of between the amateur and the professional? Um, an amateur is um, somebody that... Uh, is kind of a weekend warrior. An amateur is, is a dilettante. It's not, you're, you're not really in it for keeps. Um, when an amateur, and I say this of myself as being an amateur for years and years, when an amateur strikes adversity, a lull in the work, a rejection or whatever, the amateur will fold. You know, um, if if there's a situation in, in a person's amateur's life, if you're a businessman or a writer or something and you've got a lot of family troubles going on or financial troubles going on, um, you'll let them blow you out of the water as far as your work, right? You know, like uh, a lot of times I, when I talk, think about professionals, I think of athletes, really great athletes like Michael Jordan or Tom Brady to cite a couple of American examples. Um, and you think a, a great athlete plays hurt, you know, unless their leg is broken and the bone is coming out, you know, they're going to find one way or another they, to, to keep going because they think of themselves as, as a pro. And it's the same thing 
in, in our lives as writers or as artists or as entrepreneurs, there's always something wrong. You know, we're always running out of money. There's always some kind of setback. There's always personal issues. Um, but the, where the amateur will fold, and I certainly did many, many times, but a professional just says, hey, I'm a pro. I got, I got to do this. It's, I'm here to do this, you know? And um, so that's, that, those are some of the main, you know, pro, as I say, in turning pro, pro uh, shows up every day, no matter what. Like Stephen King writes 365 days a year, including Christmas, including his birthday, right? Pro shows up every day. A pro stays on the job all day, or at least the equivalent of a, of a gives it a full day. A pro plays hurt. You know, a pro has a level of aspiration that they refuse to fall below. If you think about athletes, right, certain great athletes, uh, they just will not accept from themselves anything less than what they know they can do. Um, so that's, that's my difference between an amateur and a pro. I also loved how um, the perception of them is entirely different. Because when I think about... Um, people that I see that I would say are in an amateur phase from the outside. It looks like it's all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh -huh. But one of the things which I loved in what you said in the book, and I included this in our newsletter because it was such a great quote. You say addiction itself is excruciatingly boring. It's boring because it's predictable. The lies, the evasions, the transparent self justifications and self exonerations. And I found this so interesting because this is a paradox because from the outside, people think being an amateur with no responsibilities is glamorous. But I completely agree with you that, you know, it's boring to keep laying yourself down. It's boring to keep not living up to your potential, turning up late. So I'd love to know, what, what was the point you were trying to make here at this specific example? Um, one of the things I was trying to make there was that um, sometimes when we're uh, afraid to follow our true calling, whatever that is, we'll pick what I call kind of a shadow calling or a shadow career that's kind of like what, we're, what, we're, what, we're, what we really should be doing, but doesn't have any of the real heart risk. You know, um, like one of the classic examples in, in Hollywood, they have entertainment law firms. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you know, there are lawyers that specialize in making deals for writers, producers, directors, and so forth. And you find when you talk to a lot of these lawyers who are very smart guys and gals, a lot of them secretly want to be writers or secretly want to be directors. And so to me, it seems like the law is a sort of shadow career for them. It's right adjacent to what they really want to be doing, but it's not it, you know? And, and a lot of times lawyers will make the leap. You know, uh, David Baldacci is one of them, the writer. I don't know if you know him, but, you know, but there are a lot of lawyers that will suddenly write a book, you know, out of no, and it's great, you know? But, it, but when I was talking about addiction, addiction is kind of like a shadow version of your real art. It's like the, the addict creates uh, a shadow work of art, which is their life. And it's full of drama. It's full of, you know, uh, car chases and trips to jail and dramatic breakups with spouses and stuff like that. And they're out on the street, they're drunk, they're beaten up, whatever, you know. And, but it's really, if you scratch the surface a little bit, they really want to be musicians or they really want to, or they're sort of halfway playing at whatever it is they're doing. And so, um, but like I say, that an addictive type of thing is boring because it's the same thing over and over and over, right? They never, you never get anywhere. It's not like you have a great, you know, heroin fix and that's, you know, you can keep it, you know, it's, but so, it also, I think that kind of addiction scenario is an amateur. It, the choice is to be an amateur. And, and it comes out of fear, I think, a lot of times. So again, addiction is a real thing. I don't mean to be a doctor. I don't mean to be a psychiatrist, you know, or make light of it. But a lot of times, I think 
if you you scratch the surface of somebody that's a perpetual drunk or addict, you'll find an artist. You find an artist that isn't doing their art or isn't doing it to the highest to the level they really want to do. Because most addicts that I've known are really interesting people and have amazing things. You'll see somebody will sit down at a piano and suddenly start playing this incredible stuff. And you go, how can you do that and be the bum that you are, you know? But it's absolutely connected. One of the things in which um, I really resonated with when I spoke to Seth, and I, I, I get the same feeling from your work, when, especially when you're talking about that example of the shadow career with the lawyer. Seth sort of took aim at this idea of finding your passion. And he said, how about you sort of decide to love what you do? And and in my case, I mean, with this podcast, I mean, this this wasn't something which... I was particularly passionate about at first. I, I I felt a sort of need to want to do it. And then after, you know, it sort of fueled a passion for it. So I wonder, where do you stand on this in terms of finding a passion? Do you think someone should look for their passion or should they create it? Where do you stand? That's a really good question. Because I, I think a lot of people who hear somebody like me saying this stuff, they think, and I would have said the same thing, and, you know, when I was 27, I would say, shit, you know, I can't find, I'm not, I don't know what I want to do, you know, and there's so much pressure, I've got to find something I love, you know, um, but I do think for me that that was the case, the, but the thing, it was a, it definitely a love-hate scenario because of resistance, you know, and what, you know, it's something that, that you really, you feel like if I could only do that, that would be fulfilling, that's really what, but it hurts so much to, to get into that cold water, you know, to face that over and over again. So, but it, I have never been able to say, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to make myself love it. No, that's me. Maybe I'm, I know that was what uh, Forrest Church said. And I thought that was pretty good, you know, but it's sort of assuming maybe that you're already doing what you should be doing. And for me, I certainly wasn't for a long, long, long time. That's really interesting. What do you think about the idea of talent? Ah, <laughs> I'm, you know, uh, I'm not a believer in talent, really. Uh, I think um, hard work is the main thing. I mean, if I, you know, I say, uh, if, you know, for 30 years for me writing, or now people say, oh, you've got talent. But for 30 years, they said, you're a bum, you know? So what's the difference? Did I suddenly develop talent? Or does any, you know, you, I think you work, you know? Um, obviously somebody like Michael Jordan, he had it from the get-go, but Tom Brady didn't, you know? He was whatever he was, drafted 289th or something like that. So I, I do think that, uh, uh, it's great to have talent, but it's what you do with it and how hard you work after that. And even if you don't have tremendous talent, I think you can make something, you can, you can succeed at certain things. Obviously you and I are not going to play, uh, you know, uh, in the world league soccer or whatever it is, you know, football, or maybe you are, but I'm certainly not. But, um, but within the sort of realm of the possible of what our natural gifts are, it, work is the big thing. I don't think I'll be playing on the world stage. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to pick up because I feel as if we're really transitioning well into um, turning pro now. So what did your first year of turning pro look like? The first which? The first year. Um, the first year of... The first year when first you made that decision year. to turn pro, yeah. Ah, okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's another sort of misconception, I think, that people have about succeeding, which is that there will be one moment, one breakthrough moment, and everything is, you know, whereas I don't think it's that at all. It's like a series of things that I, for my own sake of, my own sort of... Um, um, trajectory of turning pro went through many moments where I would kind of, I sort of thought I would turned pro, but I really only turned pro about that much, you know, and I did, and you know, and then I realized, well, I, I got to dig a little deeper, 
And then I got to dig a little deeper. I got to dig a little, you know, I thought I was there, but I'm not there. Um, but the one thing for sure is once I kind of, and I couldn't even, I didn't give it a name like turning pro at the time. It took me years to think about that. But from the point that I sort of made that decision, which for me, the decision was, I'm going to be a writer. I don't give a shit if, if nobody ever reads anything or if I'm never any good. Um, this, is, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to find a way to do it. If I have to work, you know, 80 hours a week and just, you know, do my writing in a few hours, I'm going to do it. And I can say that from that point, a tremendous weight came off my shoulders. And I really felt like um, I'm going to be okay. I'm, I'm not wandering in the wilderness anymore. I, I know what I want to do. It's just a matter of, of finding the way to do it. I love that, man. And I would love to pick up on some professional habits because when I was thinking, as you were saying there, I think that the three biggest habits I've had, which I've seen the biggest re uh, return from, would be getting a great night's sleep, exercising, and then planning out my day a day in advance. So before I go to bed, I always plan out what, whatever I have to do the next day. So what would be some of your most impactful professional habits which you do? I would, I would say just what, what you said, Joe, you know, um, and maybe some other stuff too, but definitely the night before getting ready for that, for that day is very important because the world is going to throw stuff at you, unexpected stuff. Is going to happen. You know, you're going to wake up in the morning, look at your phone and, you know, your electricity has been turned off or, you know, there are riots down on the street, or whatever, you know. And but if if we have, I mean, Michael Jordan, just as an example, he when he was playing, he wakes up in the morning, he knows he's going to do he's going to what stretch, probably go to the gym, eat a good breakfast, spend some time with his wife and kids, then he's going to go down to a practice facility and he knows exactly what he's going to do. He's going to work on turnaround jump shots on the left side, right? Then they're going to do more fitness, da, 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 da. And knowing that, you know, in advance really gives him, it's like a sailor having a, you know, a course that they're set for sailing to Tahiti or whatever it is. And not, you don't get knocked off by that. And even if your days get screwed up and you don't really do well in A, B, or C, at least you've kind of got your program going. I agree totally about exercise. It's tremendously important. And I do it first thing before I start to work. Um, and the important thing to me is not so much the physical aspect of it uh, as, as it is the mental aspect of it. Facing something that you don't want to do, that you'd rather be in bed, you know, facing something that, you, that fear is an element. You know, if you're working with weights, are you going to really be able to do what you trying to do and um, something that hurts you know something that really makes you sweat and because then when you go to your actual work to sitting down at the keyboard you feel like well i've already done i've got a rhythm going i've already done this you know a few times so yeah i, I definitely would, would say that the other thing i'm sure i'll think of a lot more things but another thing i would say about being a professional is also self-validation self-reinforcement is a huge part of it. Um, when the day is done, uh, you got to pat yourself on the back for, or find some way. Like if we go to go back to Michael Jordan, he finishes a day at practice or whatever it is. And the coach, Phil Jackson, whoever it is, will go over to him and, and say, you know, great day, Michael, you know, et cetera, whatever. Somebody else will give him that feedback. But for you or me, we have to do it ourselves. And I think it's very important. I think in, in many ways, the ability to self-reinforce, I think is more important than a lot of other things. Maybe the most important thing of all, because it's such, like as a writer or an artist, it's such a long game. You know, if you're writing a novel, it's two years, it's three years. I have a friend, Mike McClellan, who just finished this book, The Sand Sea, and it took him like 14 years. He's a lawyer and with a family and he just plugged away at it every morning, you know, but the crack of dawn and um, 
so it's a long game and and we need to reinforce ourselves as we go along you know that maybe today wasn't the greatest day ever but at least we put in our time we roll the p a little bit forward i think um when it comes to developing these professional habits um i think that one of the things in which i found difficult the resistance i faced quite early on i'm still only a young guy um was i really faced the resistance of i knew that in developing these professional habits they were going to be people that i left behind they were going to be the friends that i love to play my xbox with or that i would go partying with is that just a natural thing that when you develop these professional habits, you're going to leave people behind? Is that just a, a sad truth of it? I'm, I'm afraid it's true. You know, I'd struggle with that too, you know, um, because uh, the, the, the upside of that is you're going to meet other people yeah. that do have professional habits and are aspiring at the same level that you are. And um you know, a lot, a lot of times we're, we're, we're all facing resistance with a capital R, right? And one of the ways that we, um, that that sabotages us is we start hanging around with a bunch of friends who may be wonderful people. We enjoy them and then the fam their family, whatever, but they're kind of, they're in the same state of resistance as we are. They're not doing a damn thing either, you know? And we're all in this sort of comfortable, lukewarm pool you know, hanging around and at the pub and wasting each other's time. And when one of those people sort of makes a decision, internal decision, I'm going to really try to do something with my life. All the others are all threatened by that because it's a reproach to them. You know, like if Joe's going to do this thing, this podcasting thing, the Freedom Pack thing, well, then I should be doing it too. I should be starting my own uh, motorcycle rebuilding shop or whatever, you know, but I'm not, I'm here at the pub, you know, having another pint. So then those friends of yours will try to sabotage you and uh, friends and family. And, you know, they'll say things like, uh, you know, Joe, you're not the same guy. I don't know what happened to you. Something's changed. You know, we used to be able to have a pint and, and now you're leaving, you're going home, you're going, you're sleeping. I mean, what's that all about? Who do you think you are? You're better than us. Now, that sort of thing, right? And it, they can be very, and of course, that dialogue is echoed in our own heads. So we're saying that same thing to ourselves. You know, who do I think I am trying to, you know, leave my, my dear friends behind, you know? Jeff, you know, Jeff saved my life, you know, uh, whatever, you know? Um, so, but yeah, if you're, if you're going to follow your calling and live out a destiny, a lot of times you do wind up leaving people behind that you don't want to leave behind. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the saddest or perhaps happiest one, whatever way you choose to look at it, things about becoming professional because we sort of attract people. We, we like people that are like us. And when I'm sat at the pub, I'm not feeling guilty about not writing my newsletter or publishing a podcast or going to the gym because I'm also with people that are not doing those things as well. Yeah, so, right. So I suppose like in your case, I mean, yeah, obviously I know that you were really good friends with Seth Godin. When you re when you're really good friends with Seth, I mean, the you you you're going to want to sort of elevate yourself to, you know, to sort of fit in with that tribe and obviously the other writers and and that that's a sort of group shared behavior. So I yes. suppose sorry, John, I'm in there. No, no, no. Oh, you're right. uh, disagreeing. Yeah. So I suppose that's one of the benefits of, um, as you say, being friends as well with people with those professional habits, right? Yes. And even it's, it's, it, I found it's not, it's not friendship in the same way as it used to be with your old mates at the pub, you know, because each one of you, a friend like Seth, he's got a lot of stuff going on. He's doing stuff, you know, We're, I'm not going to be, you know, he's on one coast and I'm on another, so I don't see him that much anyway. But it's not like we're going to be hanging out, you know? Um, so it is a, you know, do you know the movie With Nail and I? I don't, I don't. Tell oh, me about God. It. Put that on your list. Okay. But it's sort of a great story about these two actors in London, you know, in the 60s. And uh, 
the, the short version of it is one guy has to kind of leave the other guy behind. And it's a really, they're both like drinking and doing drugs constantly. You know, they're, they're in a kind of that a pool of, of shadow careers, you know? And one of them gets a part, gets a break, and he has to leave his friend behind. And you can see that, uh, um, you know, they're gonna go separate ways. And, uh, but at the same time that they really love each other, they're brothers, the, the, the guy who's going forward is never gonna find a mate that's like the one that he had then, you know? It's, it's a really great movie with Nail and I. I'll, I'll check that one out. Yeah. What, one of the things in which I would love to um, ask you in terms of the, this uh, professional argument, which I love is, how does the professional approach a topic like the fear of failure, which I imagine is a massive form of resistance? Um, I, I think that uh, the professional says, this is just a part of, of, the, of the game. Whatever the game is, if we're athletes, if we're entrepreneurs, if we're gonna open a restaurant, if we're gonna to try to broker a peace conference, if we're gonna write a movie or something like that, most things fail. Um, very few succeed. And uh, so although the fear is never gonna go away, you, the professional says to herself or himself, I, I have to keep working through it. I'm gonna do the absolute best I can. I'm gonna put it out there. And if it fails, I'm gonna to try to learn from it and not take it personally, not let it destroy me. An amateur will be destroyed by failure. But a professional knows, you know, there's a famous story about a Broadway producer named Jed Harris, who had a bunch of hits in the 30s on Broadway in New York. And he was being interviewed by a young reporter. And he had had a few, some failures as well, Jed Harris. And uh, the reporter said to him, Mr. Harris, how do you explain the failures? And he started laughing. He says, that's not the question. The question is, how do you explain the hits? In other words, failure is the norm. Um, even with something that's really good, if the timing isn't right, if it comes out at a, you know, at a, it doesn't get enough publicity, if it's a, think of all the things that have happened in this COVID era. How many great, you know, books or plays or th things that were ready to go. And now, you know, this thing comes along and just knocks them out. So the failure, I think, is the norm. And the professional accepts that. Um, it's like if you're a prize fighter, you know, you're going to go in the ring, you're going to get the crap beat out of you. Even if you win, you know, you're, it's going to take you, you know, four months to get over, you know, the beating that you took in the ring. That's just kind of, that's part of the game. Yeah, and I it's think easy that, to say, but I mean, I still feel terrible at failures too. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that um, adjacent to um, this fear of failure is procrastination, right? I this is must be my worst form of resistance. This is the one in which I think is the most shameful as well, because it's sort of me saying that I'm I'm gonna put it off i'm not gonna do it now i'm gonna do it later right what, what's your thoughts on procrastination i agree with you completely joe it's a, it's it's the thing that most people and i i deal with it too i've been doing this for 50 years it's still the same thing um because procrastination is a it's a rationalization you don't say to yourself i'm never gonna write my novel you just say well i'll do it tomorrow and uh it's a really bad habit to get into and um it's probably destroys more dreams than any other other thing, right? Um, so again, a professional just sort of has to look at it and say, okay, I know I'm prone to that. I know it's gonna be there every morning. And if I wanna succeed, I'm gonna to have to find some way, to habits, you know, something like that, 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 that I can do that will make me get over that hurdle. And the other thing to remember, I think of this is everybody procrastinates. It's not, the thing is like, we all think, you and I, I'm sure we think, oh, I'm the only one. Nobody, nobody else has it. Believe me, everybody has it, you know? Resistance the, is universal. What, one of the um, things on procrastination, which I, which really helps me is I always say to myself, whenever I'm feeling massive resistance is I always say, okay, if I've got a, 
write something. I'll just go and I'll I'll I, I'll tell myself I won't do this. I'll just go and write ten words, or if I've got to go to the gym, or I'll just go and do one set and then I'll go and I'll go back to bed. And usually what happens is as soon as I've started, I'm not going to come home from the gym after doing one set. I'm going to stay there for 30, 45 minutes. So I'd love to know what sort of ways have you found personally to overcome in procrastination? Well, I have, I have a saying, which is put your ass where your heart wants to be. <laughs> and it's just like what you just said, Joe. Like if you want to write, you know, sit down in front of that. You know, if you want to work out, go to the gym, Make your, put your body there. And once your body's there, and I do that too, I said, well, I just write a couple of paragraphs. Let me just start a couple of this thing I know I have to write. And like you say, once you're into it and you get a little bit of momentum, it's like that hundred car railroad train, it's easier to, to keep going. But I find if you can put, just put your body there, that's a big, big help. I love it, man. What are the rewards? So obviously facing the person listening to this, now they're going to go, oh, well, Resistance is difficult, is universal. But what would you say are the rewards for actually overcoming it? Um, the, the negative side of it is if you don't overcome it, at the end of the day, you know, your, your life will just spiral out of control, right? You're no good to yourself. You're no good to anybody that loves you. And for me, I just would feel so terrible at the end of the day when I say I've, you know, pissed away another day, haven't done it. Um, the, the reward to me is I can sleep at night, you know, and, and I feel like, I don't know why we are on this earth, you know, is it some kind of a school that we're supposed to, you know, is it purgatory? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure what God had in mind, but I know that uh, some law wants us to not procrastinate and not, you know, fuck off and to do our work. And I'm, I'm not even a believer. I mean, Seth Godin is a believer in changing the world. You know, he wants to create change. That's one of the things he says. And I, I believe that he really wants to do that. I really, I, I don't. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can change anything. I'm just sort of trying to do what I'm supposed to do. Um, trying to face my own challenges and do that. And if anybody has changed or it's to the good, God bless them. But I'm just trying to be able to sleep and, and have some self-respect at the end of the day and say that, you know, I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I think that ties up that amateur point so nicely because whether you are the amateur and you've got no responsibilities, you still have to look yourself in the mirror and, you know, I know Tom Bilyeu says that ultimately the goal is to feel good when you're by yourself alone, right? And, and I completely, completely agree. I want to tie up this segment before I shoot you some quick fire questions that we always ask uh -huh. is what would, based on your work, based on turning pro, do the work, the war of art and everything you've seen and all these, this amazing life which you've lived, what would be perhaps one bit of advice which you would have for the person listening to this now that is beginning or that's in the middle of following their dreams, what would your best advice for them to be? Uh, that's a great question. I could give a few pieces of advice, but I think the one thing is uh, don't be too hard on yourself. I think we all have uh, what Joseph Campbell calls a hero's journey, right? We're all, and it's all kind of the same. Even in my days when I was living in my van and, and, you know, working all these jobs in the end, they were really good for me. It was my, it was my hero's journey. I sort of needed to go through all that, all that time when I was an amateur, if I had been really hard on myself and say, Oh, you're a co bum, you know, too, that would have not been good. Uh, so I think we all have to kind of have that hero's journey where we're kind of searching, we're testing alternatives, you know, and uh, um, it's great if you can enjoy it, even if it's hell on earth while you're going through it. And I would count addiction as a hero's journey too. A path to addiction is the same kind of thing because it's just like the hero's journey. You meet, 
you meet great friends, you meet allies, you meet enemies, you meet shapeshifters, you meet people who are trying to screw you up. Um, and, but it's all grist for the mill. It all, it's, it's all good. Um, and I think uh, if we can just kind of keep the faith, when the time is ready, we'll, we'll hit the moment where we turn the corner and we say, okay, enough of this bullshit. Now I got to get down, get down to business. Um, the other one, the one thing I will say also, it's a piece of advice that uh, uh, a director gave to me when I first got out to Hollywood and was a starving young writer. He just said, keep working. He said, take, take, don't turn anything down. Don't turn down porn flicks. Don't turn down slasher. Don't turn down stuff for free. Keep working in your field. And even if what, because you're, you're learning as you go, it's a long process, anything. We all think, you know, to be a brain surgeon, it takes whatever, 13 years. Why is it any different to be a writer or a filmmaker or a podcaster or anything? It takes a long time. So I would just say to somebody, be, be patient with yourself, give yourself some slack. We're all on a journey and uh, things will work out in the end if we keep, if we keep the faith and keep trying. Keep going. I love it, man. Keep going. What have been some of the most impactful books that you've read in your life? Um, mostly, uh, you know, uh, a lot of my fiction is set in the ancient world, is set in ancient Greece. And um, some of the great works from that era, you know, Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, these uh, that are so deep such you know so far beyond anything anybody's writing now those books have really sort of give me kind of a grounding and and also establish a sort of a level of aspiration you know that you can never reach but it's great to try for um but i I'm, i think maybe joe you were hoping i was going to say something modern that you could go out and buy and that but I, i've never really found any kind of a what you might call a selfie help self-help type of thing um it's much more the the great works of the past um fiction and, and non-fiction any names of any books so we, we get a wide variety of uh, recommendations um he, uh, uh now this book is not going to change anybody's life i just think it's the greatest one of the greatest things ever is thucydides history of the peloponnesian war I know it sounds incredibly dry, but if you used to go to Eton or any of those places, you had to read it in Greek, you know? Um, and the reason you had to read it was because was people felt like this was a real foundation of Western civilization, that, that type of book. Um, I would say uh, Herodotus, the histories, which is also from that era. Um, Xenophon wrote a book called The Education of Cyrus. Uh, that's also a oh, great, but almost anything back there, any of the Socratic dialogues that Plato wrote, I'm sure nobody wants to hear this, but these are, these are really great stuff that really, really fortifies you. And the Bible, the King James Bible, to me, one of the all time great, just, just for the poetry of it, you know? I love it, man. And any books which have stood the test of time have stood the test of time for a reason. Yeah, yeah, they, that's right, for a reason. For a reason. So my last question for you today, before I get you to sign off and tell these guys where they can connect with you, is what makes a life worth living? Um, I'm a believer that we come into this world already a fully formed personality. We're not a blank slate that can, you know, I'm a believer in previous lives. So I think we, we come into this world with a destiny and more than with a destiny, with a kind of an obligation, a calling that um, I, I, I always like to think of like an artist, somebody like Bob Dylan, uh, if you think about all of the albums that he's done, you know, if we could put them, project them on the wall behind us. I sort of believe that those albums kind of existed in pure potential form before he was born. He was born to bring those albums into existence, you know, or something like that, you know, and, and I think that we all tend to 
uh, low rate ourselves in the world of democracy where everybody's the same. Oh, I'm just, I was meant to be, you know, something modest, you know, I don't think so. I, th I think we all have a destiny. And so uh, a life that's sort of worth living is when, when you fulfill, try to, or at least try to fulfill that, that destiny. And it's a, a fact, a function of going within, of connecting with the unconscious, of connecting with the muse. And, but in, in this, like in Bob Dylan's case, it's just writing a song, writing another song, writing another song, you know, uh, it comes to him. Oh man, you know, positively fourth street, he writes it, you know? And then 10 years later, he's evolved to a certain stage and he writes something else. And it's coming out of him. God bless him that he was able to connect with that source and let it come out. So, and of course, that's just the individual life. It's not, we're not talking about family, we're not talking about raising children or the community or anything like that. But I think that that comes first, the finding who we are. We already are somebody, we already are. And if you watch kids and even little kittens and puppies, as they come into the world, they already are who they are, right? There's one that's more adventurous and one that's not, you know, um, one that's got a lot of love to give, another one that's really brave, you know? And, and same thing with all of us. We already are who we are. We don't have any choice about that, but our job is to find out who that, what that is, and then have the courage and, and, and the professionalism, meaning the, you know, the common sense, the, the left brain stuff, to, to make it happen in the real world i love it i love it man your books have been unbelievably impactful in my life i know they've they've made a massive impact so i can only pay my gratitude to you for writing such works of art well thank you joe thanks for having me on here i hope this has been helpful to, to a few people it's been absolutely amazing can you tell these guys where they can connect with you and what upcoming projects or anything you want these guys to, to, to take away. Um, I have a website. That's just my name, Stephen Pressfield. Um, I, I have a, a series on a video series on Instagram now called the warrior archetype. If you just log on to Stephen underscore Pressfield, you'll find it. And I have a book coming up in like about six months. I and mean, I'll show this. It's called, it's a, it's called the man at arms. It's a, it's a novel set in the ancient world, but uh, I'm, you know, it's too early to do much with that. But uh, yeah, whatever. It's just great to be here. I'm glad we uh, we had this conversation. Thanks for the great questions. You know, I got to give it to you, Joe. You're very prepared and really thinking deep. And if you worry about, <laughs> did you do the right thing today? You did. Oh man, thank you so much. That's that's really kind of you, Stephen. I will link everything below. Thank you so so much for time. Thank you so so much for your time today, sir. It was a real privilege for me. All right, thank you, Joe, and all the best to Freedom Pact and to everybody that's listening.